Well, good morning, everyone. Um, whatever time zone you may be in, hello. Um, thank you for joining us for our webinar today uh, titled Faster, More Scalable and Cost-Effective Ad Delivery and Analysis for Digital Marketers. Uh, the goal today is to really showcase the capabilities, combined capabilities of Aquifer and Molecula. Uh, joining me, I've got Daniel J, CEO of Aquifer. Uh, so Dan, thank you for joining us today. Um, excited to have you here. It's great to be here. Very excited about uh, the solutions we're delivering together. Yes, likewise. Um, so what we're going to do today um, for everyone involved is first, we're going to walk through a little introduction and overview of Molecula. We'll do the same uh, for Aquifer, talk about our joint capabilities, and then we'll have some Q&A afterwards. So in terms of ground rules, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll answer them afterwards. Also feel free to email us uh, after the webinar today, and we're happy to address any questions that you may have. Um, we'll also be posting a recording of this, so if you feel like you need to watch it again or share it with a colleague, uh, we will be sharing a recording of this uh, webinar after. So let's dive in a little bit on the molecular side. Um, as I said, I'm HO, the CEO, and we founded this company on the idea that data access remains a very difficult task. Uh, I think we're all pretty much aware that we're generating more data than we've ever generated, but I don't think we're as aware about how little of that data we're actually using. And you know, this, this has been a problem throughout my career. So as an entrepreneur who builds companies predicated on data, I've always had a tremendous struggle getting data out and putting it to use. And it was at our last company that we invented a technology that uniquely solved this problem, right? We call it cloud data access and it unlocks 100% of the data that's trapped inside of a company so that you can put it to work to make better decisions, to do better analysis. And we're very excited to tell you a little bit more about it. Um, we do have an open source platform called Pelosa. We have over 2000 companies that are using the open source product and we have a commercial version that we launched about a year ago and very excited to work with some of the biggest companies in the world, solving some of the most audacious and exciting uh, data challenges out there. And I think from a big picture perspective, the trend and opportunity that we see in the market today is that while clouds are providing better data services than ever, databases are becoming more ubiquitous. What it's really done is just created more fragmentation. Uh, there is no single cloud anymore. A cloud of clouds is forming, especially for data. Um, there is a database, a data source, an API, a SaaS service for just about everything now. So answering simple questions about your customers is no longer as easy as querying one system or querying one database. You might have dozens of systems that have different components about that customer or that product or you know, that device that you need to know information about. So we believe that data is more hybrid than ever, and this is a problem that's not going to stop. So Molecula is here to help address this. And specifically, the problem that we're seeing in the market today is that the effort required to make data available to the business is far exceeding the value that we can create, especially for more modern analytical types. If you're simply doing BI and you're okay with the batch jobs running overnight, that's fine. Uh, but if you want to do predictive, prescriptive, or proactive analytics, uh, you may think that's easy on the business side, but IT has a very hard time uh, delivering on that data. And the problem is so big that McKinsey estimates only 1% of data is effectively accessible to the average global 2000 company. Another statistic that we think is incredibly interesting along these lines is that last year, data engineering jobs grew at 122%, while data science jobs grew at 40%. That should be the exact opposite. We are spending far too much energy figuring out how to get the data to the business rather than giving the business the power to use that data. And I think the statistic that really uh, obsesses us here at Molecula is that only 15% of data today is original. The other 85% is copies that we've made in order to get better analytics and insights to make decisions from that data. And we think that is crazy. We should only have one copy of our data wherever it's you know, jurisdictionally, politically, and technically the safest. Uh, but beyond that, we should not be making copies in order to get to decisions. And the reason we do so is that traditional techniques for analyzing data do exactly that, make copies. So 
Uh, historically, other approaches have fallen short in our estimation. So one approach that's you know, reinvented about every five to 10 years is query federation. So let's say your customer data is in 25 different systems. Uh, using a query federation tool, you can fan out that query, go query the 25 systems and bring back the data to stitch it together. But good luck trying to get that to be performant. Good luck trying to do joins with that. You know, it might be good for a quick analysis, but you are not going to make a millisecond decision about what ad to put in front of that user or how to personalize their journey or how to make an underwriting decision um, based on that data. And when query federation becomes too slow, which is always, um, and you need performance, you move into the next column where most of the offense in terms of copies live. So data aggregation is the technique that we typically use to pre-join, to pre-compute data so that it is faster on the analytical side. Columnar databases reign in this world, and we are doing a lot of pre-processing of data so that we can feel like we're asking questions of it in real time. But the reality is we are adding batch processes. We're adding a lot of time between the original data and the decision that we're making from it. We're adding complexity and we're adding security risk by maintaining more copies of all of that data. And of course, you can throw brute force techniques at this in memory databases, GPUs, FPGAs, but your cost per query is going to be astronomical. So that would have to be, you know, um, um, you know, extreme uh, performance, extreme use cases for those brute force approaches. And so what Molecula brings to the table is a new approach uh, around creating data abstractions or data representation. So we create a mathematical representation of the underlying data that is a fraction of the size and that is specifically designed for all analytical and machine learning workloads without the need to copy, federate, or move the original data. So that is the core of our IP. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how that works. But first to just drive the problem statement home. Um, the problem isn't storing the data, right? We're storing web clicks in S3. We're storing um, the information that's coming in from our IoT sensors. We're storing all of the customer data. The problem is it's huge. It sits in a lot of systems and it's diff difficult to operationalize. So today, the path to drive access to that data from the business is to create copies in a whole slew of systems. So on average, there's six copies for every piece of original data. And this process of operationalizing it with, with these traditional approaches just creates time, creates risk, creates all of the problems that we talked about earlier. And you know, the poor business uh, on the right-hand side just wants to put it to work, but they can't. So the way we solved this problem, and it was a complete penicillin moment, um, at our last company, we were storing data on fans. These are sports fans going to games, watching games on TV. And our clients wanted to know everything there was to know about them. And we found out that that data was really sitting in about 100 different systems. So we created all of the technology to bring it all together. And when we got to about a half billion fans in our system that had over 100 million data points, we started suffering the same problem everybody else did, performance. Um, unless we cached it or batched it or sampled it, uh, we could not do ad hoc queries. We could not power the applications that we had built for our customers. So what we ended up inventing was a value-oriented data format that very uniquely solved that problem. We didn't realize what we had quite solved until we put it in production against the original sort of traditional systems. We were using Cassandra as a persistent data store, Elasticsearch to serve up our most important query. That query was taking about 20 seconds. And when we tested it against our value-oriented format, we got two millisecond response times with two servers. And within weeks, we had decommissioned our entire Hadoop soup ecosystem. Um, and we knew we'd invented something pretty exciting. Um, and it wasn't until about three years ago that we spun out those patents and launched Pelosa, the open source platform, and now Molecula, the company that's commercializing that technology. And if you think about the history of data, a value-oriented format makes complete sense, right? In the 70s, we invented row-wise formats that were really good at transactions, you know, storing and retrieving certain, you know, single records. Uh, since then, we started finding ways to build analytical data sets. OLAP cubes eventually led to columnar databases. 
We've seen a decade of columnar data format solving our analytical workloads using copies and the techniques we talked about earlier. And we feel the world is now wanting to do more than just basic BI and basic insights. And it no longer tolerates batch. It no longer tolerates pre-processing. This all has to be done in real time. And so what we're introducing to the world is a value-oriented format to solve for this problem in a very, very unique and powerful way. Um, the core platform now is wrapped in an enterprise technology that we call Molecula. Molecula makes that value-oriented format incredibly easy to use so that data engineers can deploy it easily um, so that the businesses can adopt that technology and put it to use in their applications, getting you know, continuous insights and going from data to business outcomes um, without having to wait for IT for every single facet of the project. And then, of course, you want performant queries inside of your applications to drive better user experiences. Um, and because of the uniqueness of the data format that we created, we bring some very novel security applications to, uh, to the world. So being able to do cell level data access, um, our representations that we create don't actually contain values. So they're much, much safer to store. And in, interestingly, these representations that we create are 10 to 100 times smaller than the data that we're representing. And that movement, I mean, that, that, that reduction in footprint is not just in, uh, in, in the systems that the data sits, but it's in movement as well and across the network. So controlling the data is something that's very important to our customers. And so with Molecula, we can go back to that same slide that we saw earlier, you're still storing massive amounts of data, but getting it into your applications, whether that's powering internal analytics or customer facing analytics or personalization or machine learning pipelines is now something that is much, much easier. If you have permission to the data and your application developers want to put it into an app, they no longer have to wait for IT to do this. They now can get real time continuous access to their ad performance, to their customers, to their visitors, and do time series queries over days, months, years, the entire history of the data, or you know, the last few minutes uh, of performance uh, against that data. So it completely opens up a new world. And we're very excited to have some, some great customers on the molecular side. Uh, this technology, as I talked about earlier, was born out of the last company that all of our founders founded called Umble, uh, where we tracked fans and we could do things like redu reduce churn for you know, the Dallas Museum of, of, of Art, um, or we could uh, help Disney personalize all of their web properties, drive better pricing, drive better ad performance um, by just doing the analytical part. We don't do the piece that Aquifer does, which you're gonna hear about in just a moment, but just by being able to do analytics on that data, it unlocked a tremendous amount of value. And I think one of our favorite use cases is in financial services, just being able to use real-time data from almost 40 million users to drive personalized experiences, drive personalized offers down to the millisecond. Everything these 37 million customers have ever done and what they're doing at that given moment is driving conversions and value that was never possible before. So that's it on Molecula. Um, and now I would like to turn it to Dan to tell us a little bit about Aquifer. Terrific, and and uh, that was a great overview, H.O., and uh, helped, uh, uh, I think, inform exactly why uh, we're so excited about the partnership between what we're doing at, at, at Aquifer. So Aquifer, we offer a marketing data platform. This is somewhat of a, a new concept, but basically what we're providing is a service-oriented layer that uh, provides the... Um, the, the building blocks and services for solving these canonical problems in marketing and advertising big data management. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our, our background in that we've been sort of solving these problems at a variety of companies uh, like AOL and Yahoo and as service providers to some of the largest companies in digital media. Uh, and we, we, what we found is that there were repeating patterns of, of of solutions people were building over and over again. And very often these are what we would call table stakes. They are the things you have to do. You have to have a data pipeline for bringing in 
data about consumer interactions, exposures. Um, you have to have some ability to organize that and to be able to look at it by audience, by segment, by user. Um, you have to have some ability to reconcile identity across different activation platforms and partners and data sources. So identity management and identity resolution is always a key piece. And then finally, if you're actually moving to or, 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 or you know, taking full advantage of this, you actually don't want this to just be buried in a database, whereas as HO said, you may only really be getting benefit of one or 10% of the data. You actually want it actually informing the decisions that you're making at the point of engagement with the consumer. So we've built a set of solutions that we're providing to marketing solutions providers, agencies, systems integrators that sort of solve this table stakes problem, but for very, very uh, large and massive amounts of complex data, not just customers, but also the upper funnel and prospects, not just audience segments or point in time data about consumers, but events and time series data. And then again, looking at that full life cycle. So the components that we've delivered for this include at our core, what we call our marketing data platform, which has its at heart a combination of of data management, data lake, and data mart technologies. We have a universal tag for instrumenting digital media to doing active intelligent collection and identity management at the point of engagement with the consumer. We have a real-time component called Aquifer IO, which is designed to not provide the decision um, making solutions, the, the strategic investigation BI applications that your own employees are using as a, as a brand or marketer, but actually the real-time decisions for that consumer, whether it be real-time bidding decisions on advertising creatives, whether it be dynamic creative optimization, whether it be personalization on your own website or owned media, it's decisions and recommendations in real time. And then finally, we have a component that deals with identity resolution, which is becoming um, more and more complex. Um, the combination of all of these is a configurable, repeatable, but customizable solution for um, solution providers. So we typically aren't providing this directly to a brand or a marketer or a retailer. We're actually providing this to the people who are out delivering solutions. In this, in this diagram, the thing's in green. So our partners are delivering attribution analytics, segmentation and audience um, definition tools, campaign execution and optimization tools, um, media planning and other media analytics. There's a wide variety of, of, of uh, personalization tools that, that um, are delivered that leverage the API and services that we provide. Um, the, the, the other component of this is that we're also providing solving these canonical table stakes problems in terms of integration. So when you work with Aquifer, you get built in big data detailed log level integrations with you know, products like Media Math or, or a Trade Desk, uh, data from uh, the uh, activation platforms from your partners, whether it be Comscore or Nielsen, um, you know, dozens of partners. And in particular, the hard part that we're dealing with is the real world operational data management issues. So before you can get access to that data, you have to turn it into something that's understandable. And so there are harmonization, standardization processes that need to happen so that not only do you know that Bob in this system is Robert in this other system, but you need to know how to crosswalk a campaign identifier to a placement identifier, or you need to be able to um, harmonize data about um, age ranges from this provider versus individual ages from another provider. Lots of different scenarios. So, what we're dealing with is sort of the messiness of the, of the raw data, and also in some cases, the um, reliability issues. So, you know, two use cases that I call out, one would be where you're getting large amounts, and when we talk about large, we're talking about billions of events per day. 
and you're getting large amounts of data from various different applications, enterprise applications and partners, and there are in the real world hiccups. There are issues where data gets restated, it gets delayed, maybe there's a replication issue um, in the source systems. And so you end up with out of order or unreliable data arriving that then arrives or is restated later on. Part of what our platform does is extremely efficiently continually refactor and organize data, that data into the form it would have been if it had arrived properly. So that's very important because at the scale we're dealing with, cost is a major factor. So you need to be very efficient. You can't afford, as some companies do, to just reprocess seven days of data every day, right? So not only do you have only you know, seven times, seven copies of the data, but you have 50 copies of the data because you reprocess it seven times and every time you replicate it seven times. So it actually, you know, it, it's, it's an exponentially bad problem. So again, being able to take that, that data and be able to sort of refactor it in place is sort of one of the sort of under the cover capabilities that's very important to our platform. The second example is not where somebody did something wrong, but it just happens in the world of near real-time data processing. You have a consumer, let's say, who's using their phone, they're watching a video, some content that's very important to your company, and their battery dies or they go into the subway, it gets interrupted. And you end up with these sub events that are logically related to the actual consumer engagement with your content that may arrive five, six, seven hours later. But we live in a real time world now. That data had to be continuously streamed through your processes. It had to be deployed into your various different applications. And now all of a sudden you found out that not only did they start watching the video, they watched it completely um, and purposefully until you know 100% completion, but you don't know that for five hours. How do you get that late arriving sub event back in the data where it should have arrived originally? So these are the types of sort of real world messy problems that people brush over that are important in sort of a, a production, high scale, high complexity data platform. I think the next slide then talks a little bit about um, you know why you know, we're excited about this molecular solution. And, you know, our background comes from doing this as a service provider for large companies. And we've continuously seen the issue that HO talked about. That's why I was vigorously nodding my head because they're exactly the issues we've seen over time, which is, okay, I can get the data into a reliable data store, but now getting access to it is just too painful. The query tools, the data access tools, they're just not fast enough. They, ju they just don't provide the ability to really do the types of analysis that many of our customers need to do as fast as they need to do. And it's not just about speed, it's about agility. One of the problems with materializing all of these data structures is that um, a lot of the highly aggregated data structures that are very performant, not only is there a delay and an overhead cost, but changing them often is very hard and takes time. And so I'd say that the number one issue is, is in some cases not just you know, speed of access to the data, it's the agility to change the way you look at data. And again, that's to me one of the, the really exciting things about, about uh, what Molecula does. So you know, the combination of our solution and Molecula gives you the ability of not only getting to market quickly with solutions that can take data and plug into all of these data sources, you don't have to maintain those data sources, you don't have to worry about operating the pipelines, but the data goes into your own environment um, in your own virtual private cloud, and now you have Molecula to, to, to point at that data to give to basically unlock the power of that data. So again, it's extremely complementary and it's a class of solution that that, uh, that we're, we're just very excited because we see the need for our customers. I, I think there might be one more slide of detail behind this. Yeah, so again, end-to-end -end solution, our solution will deal with bringing in the data. It could be actively collected for our universal tag directly on your owned media, your paid media, harmonized, your enterprise data, your syndicated third-party data, 
dealing with that key management, that sort of master data management identity or data subject management problem for um, and getting that into a point so that when you want to bring the data together, now you understand, is it Bob or Robert? But more importantly, you know, are you dealing with household data? Are you dealing with network address data, contact mechanism data, user agent data, device data, organization account data? Um, part of the problem that you have to solve is using identity graphs as a lens onto the underlying data so that you can view the data the way that your business needs to view it. And that's where Molecula steps in for, for us. That's where they're now able to tie into our data stores, our APIs, and then provide and unlock the, the access to that data so that you can ask these complex detail-oriented questions, right? The interesting and powerful questions are the questions that at the end require you to understand um, aggregated behavior and attributes of individuals, right? That's the reason why aggregated data doesn't work, not just because it's duplicated and it's not agile, but also it can't even answer the questions. If we're talking about multi-touch attribution, I need to know for a given consumer, what were all the touch points for that consumer that led or prece preceded that, um, you know, that outcome that I was interested in. I can only do that with longitudinal data. Um, in other cases, I may be able to interpolate, I may be able to use other approaches where I don't have that longitudinal ID, but always I need that granular detailed data. And more importantly, I need the ability to do more sophisticated analysis, right? I need to be able to, if I wanna find the causal relationship between let's say my marketing investments and outcomes versus just the correlative in relationship. I don't wanna just do a group buy and a sum, right? I, I need to be able to explore that data. I need to be able to look at how changes in variables perturb the outcomes or perturb the results. That type of analysis, I need the power of a solution like uh, uh, what Molecula can provide because it can provide access to so much data at detail in the timeframes that, that, um, that are useful to my business. Dan, I think every time I hear that, I get incredibly excited. Um, I think it's been neat to see how our two approaches to the world are quite complementary. Um, you know, in my career previous to Molecula, I spent a lot of time in the digital marketing world and the problems that you solve of bringing all of that data together, um, getting it in one place, and most importantly to me, is giving complete control of that data to your customers is just something that is not possible. Today in digital media, you're dealing with a lot of third parties who are owning and controlling and monetizing that data uh, and making it incredibly hard for you to make good sound business decisions. So, you know, I, I love that you uniquely solve that problem in the market and that we can bring sort of sub-second analytics on top of that. Um, so very, very exciting. And so maybe, you know, would you just run us through these bullets that we put together on sort of the, the overall value proposition of the two organizations? Very excited to do this. I mean, the, the, the business cases of once you solve these technical problems, that, that, that we can solve for, 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 uh, for our solutions providers and their clients, you know, are, are, are really, um, really amazing to me, right? Because we have, number one, we have this continuous data processing requirements, but now we want to actually be able to react to those. So when something happens, you know, the stock market drops or a competitor does something or something happens in our, in our environment, like what we're dealing with now, uh, with the pandemic, you need to be able to react to that. And I've seen it over and over again that that's where the agility comes in. So again, being able to get those meaningful insights, um, orders of magnitude faster, um, we've seen that with, with, with the, the Pelosa technology that Molecula is built on, we've seen that uh, you know, we, can, we, can, we can answer questions in under a second that took tens of seconds before, or minutes, or, or even many minutes, depending on the, technology, the database technologies that, that a customer wanted, um, and also do this with high concurrency. So the point is your business is agile, responsive, and 
Um, I think also very importantly, it's able to do kind of discovery as opposed to, you know, sort of tactical or operational analytics, right? You know, very often the question you want to ask, you don't know you want to ask it until you've gotten two or three answers. And so again, that sort of discovery process is, is the reason why time becomes so important because if it takes minutes or even a minute to get an answer, the likelihood is that your business user in today's world is gonna to have to go work on something else. And by the time they come back, it's an hour later. So, you know, the difference between, a, you know, seconds or sub-second response and many seconds or minutes often in today's world ends up being effectively an hour just because everyone's multitasking. Yes, um, and Dan, on that point, you know, you live in a world where things operate incredibly fast. And you know your approach has been inc incredible, and I want to touch on that a little bit more in the Q and A. But you know we still see long-running queries that take hours and days to compute cubes that are then used to do personalization, and you know you know days go by between the data getting generated and the data getting used, and it's it's so sad to witness. But you know hopefully we can help bring something to the world that will solve for that. Right. I, I, yeah, absolutely. That, that's, again, why we're very excited about this. And, and, and then the second point is really, I think, the, the, in some ways, the most exciting thing about the relationship here, which is that Molecular can drive those business decisions, the modeling, the insights, the updates to the, as I said, the predictive models or the, in, or, or the, 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 the learnings, but, um, and it can do, you know, enable really exciting large-scale inference as well, but operational or tactical inference, that is the, the, the process of making decisions or applying insights at the point of consumer engagement, which is incredibly critical, um, is really important. And that drives that sort of third use, that third benefit, which is you know, user engagement, user interactions are in some ways the most valuable thing to any marketer, right? You've got the consumer there. The last thing you want to do is screw it up, right? The last thing you want to do is make a poor decision or not optimize, you know, everything that you spent to get the 0.01% of consumers to engage with your own media, let's say. So you want to be taking advantage. You don't want to have access to 1% of the data. You don't want to have access to the data. Oh, three days later, I could have done this. You know, you want to have that available at the time. So whether it be personalization, um, you know, it could be, you know, it, it could be applications, obviously, A-B testing, um, optimizing content, um, you know, whatever decision you're making, it could be pricing decisions, lots of different um, of applications here, uh, risk decisions. You want those to be able to take advantage of the data at the point of engagement and specifically without having to copy the data. Because a lot of solutions out there will do this, but you've got to go put your, your data over in somebody else's application. And the beauty of both of our models is that, you know, we're avoiding that data proliferation, uh, which brings to the, set, the, the second to last point, which is security and privacy. So again, you know, I, I talk about the issue um, of, of, you know, we used to, there used to be an ad on the TV, it says at seven o'clock, do you know where your children are? So we'd say at seven o'clock, do you know where your data is? Because in today's world, you probably have six copies of the data. I've actually seen cases where there's 10 copies of the data and they're not even in, still in your company. There are 10 copies at other companies, right, of different subsets of data. And how do you apply the increase in governance and oversight that we have GDPR, we now have CCPA, we're probably going to have CPRA, uh, which is going to raise the bar in California to be closer to GDPR. So you know, proliferation of data creates risk. Um, keeping the data in your own control, in your own environment, your own virtual private cloud is one of the ways of addressing that. Also moving the, bringing the applications to the data instead of the data to applications is we think sort of that critical next generation marketing architecture. That's huge. And then, yep, yeah, absolutely. And then finally, having data governance and privacy management built into sort of the DNA of the product. So the great thing with Molecula is there are no pseudonymous IDs. It's, you know, a lot of systems will do things, oh, we'll just hash the ID, right? 
in molecular is great is that the data is all encoded in very efficient ways to optimize its consumption. But the byproduct of that is you've inherently got you, you've, you've basically, um, you know, masked the data so that um, you, you've created a real technical barrier to re-identification or, or misuse of that data. You combine that with what we're doing where we're instrumenting the data and annotating it throughout its life cycle with the policies that are effective over that data, with active data governance and data collection, with active data governance at data access, with auditing of the use of the data through its process. This is how we raise the bar to address sort of that ongoing set of lists. And then the last thing is, and you gotta do this for less money than it ever cost before because no one's looking to pay more for any of this. Um, so data is expanding by 10X, but guess what? The budget's not 10X more. You've gotta find a way to get sublinear scalability, you know, in terms of uh, sorts of resources and costs required. And again, the architectures that we're deploying here are solutions that really, you know, they're not incremental, right? They're, 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 they're dramatically different than the approaches that have been taken in the past. Yeah, love all of that. And I think, you know, interestingly enough, we have a question from the audience about that exactly. Um, so um, what, would, what would you say to someone who asked, uh, can't I just throw all of this in Google and use BigQuery to solve this? You know, um, how, how would you respond to that, Dan? Sure. Um, we have a lot of experience with, with BigQuery for these types of data sets. It's a fantastic technology. Um, big fans of, 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 of the team over there and what they've done. Um, but at a, at, a, at a high level, it's it's solving things a, a different way. I mean, part of it is that I love the fact that it's a serverless solution, but because of that, there, there's some optimizations they're not able to do because they have to represent this data for a wide, for a wide range of, of customers over effectively shared resources and shared, and shared hardware. And although that works really well in a lot of cases and, and, and cases that we use at, at, at Aquifer, what we found is number one, you know, the, the data structures are still, you know, often columnar data structures internally that require large amounts of data scanning. It's not something that fits in memory. It doesn't have sort of the, the attributes that, that you have with a, um, uh, with, with, with a, with a Pelosa in terms of being able to support this type of an analysis. We don't, we don't really, we get to, we get to maybe seconds and tens of seconds, but we don't get to sub-second. There's also this issue around joins, all right, that inherently, um, you know, the data is, is structured in a way you put it into different tables, you have to do joins. They're really good at optimizing this. They're, 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 they're as smart as anybody working on this, but fundamentally the solution that they're solving involves you know, an ability to, to sort of get at the data in a way where it doesn't, it can't use the encodings that we have available with a molecular type of platform. So I think, I think um, HO, you could talk more about sort of like head to head, but We've, we've, we've used it for these types of problems and we can see where it runs into walls. Yeah, and I think, you know, you make a lot of really good points and I think one of the interesting ones is joins. Um, and I think joins tend to be one of the major culprits when it comes to having to pre-aggregate and pre-process data. You know, if you think of something as simple as, you know, an ad tag, right? It has an ID and a behavior associated with it. That really means nothing until you join it with the revenue and the, and the, and the customer. And all of that pre-joining is where a lot of the copies happen and a lot of the batch processes happen. And then even then you're still ending up with slow, you know, queries. So, so yeah, I think that, that, is, that is certainly an interesting point. And I wanna elevate this a little bit in the Q&A, but before then, I, th I think one thing I would love for you to address a little bit further is tell the audience about your serverless technology. Um, I think it's super important to understand that in our world of data, most databases are kept hot so that you can answer any questions that's come in. And, keeping things hot comes at great expense. And so you've done some fascinating things to innovate there. And I, I think it'd be worth sharing with the audience. Sure. Uh, at a high level, I was talking before about this issue about messy data, 
that that you know if all we were doing is dumping more water in the bucket right that would be that in, in some ways that would be a much simpler problem right the, the the hard part is i i have to i have to change the the nature of the data so what we're doing where we build most of our our technology and the data our primary uh, data repository in our marketing data platform is serverless data. Uh, we believe that there's smart serverless and there's dumb serverless. And we've spent a lot of time avoiding dumb serverless, which is basically, we're going to do stuff we used to, but we're just going to charge you more, uh, is often the case, right? And it won't work as well because we're also going to make you share, you're going to have noisy neighbor problems because you share resources with others, et cetera. Whereas smart serverless is where really there's been a different approach to accessing the data you know and we see that where you know things like pushing down predicate evaluation to the storage layer something that we started i was an advisor to tisa many years ago when they started and their big innovation was this idea about look one part of this is making sure that you only get the data you need right so you know, technologies that do that, technologies that amortize a lot of the overhead of managing swarms of, of containers and instrumentation. There are a number of these technologies that are smart as opposed to, you know, what I'll call dumb, which is where, oh, we're just going to do what we did, but we're just going to put a meter on it. We're just going to have a huge pool of them and we're going to charge you 20% higher than on-demand prices. And, yeah. and the sort of secret is to optimize you know, what you take advantage of, where you, you get those orders of magnitude improvements and cost of efficiency, as opposed to the places where, oh, I'm just saving, you know, I'm saving system admin costs, and I'm going to pay an extra 40%. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that is a, a piece of the puzzle not to be underestimated. We hear constantly about huge cost overruns, trying novel cloud techniques to lower those costs and only being surprised that you know those monthly bills come out a lot higher than expected. So I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle. And I think you know one question I would love to pose, you know, with those uh, technical examples in mind, can you tell us your ideal customer about your ideal customer and maybe go into a successful implementation? Sure. So our ideal customer is a solutions provider who um, is solving problems that require access to granular, you know, detailed or log level data um, for, you know, typically brands, retailers, um, it could be uh, loyalty companies, financial services, uh, um, some media companies, but where they're dealing with a lot of not just owned media interactions, but they're also making, specific, you know, significant investments in prospecting or, or paid media as well. And what they want to do typically is deliver a solution that needs to integrate that full customer journey, right? From the upper funnel through, you know, even offboarding, customer support and offboarding. So that sort of full, not just 360 view inside, but the inside and outside view. That's typically the type of solution. So that could be, you know, uh, a media analytics auditing attribution optimization vendor. It could be somebody who is a data syndicator. We work with a lot of folks who have data products and they're either trying to um, enrich those data products or they're trying to enhance their value by showing with their customers how well, you know, basically show their customers um, how useful their data products are. Right. In other words, what's the benefit? How do I tie that to my outcomes? Sort of data attribution versus media attribution, if you will. Um, other customers that we deal with are dealing with um, compliance issues, right? So they're 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 finding I, I I have data coming from different places, and by the time it gets to my factory, my my sort of data factory metaphor, um, I don't know what I'm allowed to do with it anymore, right? So I need to figure out that. This, um, this high net worth customer and this auto intender, I really want to know, yeah, I, if I put those together, I've got this set of this audience of luxury auto intenders, except that the data come from, came from different places at different times, and now I've got all these rules about what I can do and can't do with it. So if I don't have that type of effectivity data over, over the details, I, I lose my flexibility. 
So, I mean, those are a couple of examples. One use case that we run into um, is, um, is media analytics. So where people are, you know, combining their, their digital campaign data, it could be OTT, smart TV, ACR data with, um, you know, traditional display and video uh, uh, um, measurement data. They want to tie that into what's happening on their own website. And they want to basically see not just, you know, what investments in media were leading to, you know, people visiting or purchasing, but they want to actually look at like lifetime value or if there are financial services, they want to, may want to know, this is the, the, the customer who actually passed the credit check as opposed to just applied. Or even the, the customer who not only passed the credit check, opened an account, but didn't have high recidivism. Right, so that ability to stitch end to end, to take an outcome or a signal and look seamlessly back at all of the events that led to it over the last 365 days or more. You know, those are the problems that we solve for people. And again, what we run into is, yes, we can solve that more efficiently than anyone else, but we don't think that's good enough. We think it needs to be, we, need, we want somebody to answer that question and ask the next question right after it and not say, I can answer that question, but I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go get a drink or, or, or get, go to the water fountain or, 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 or get a snack in the meantime while they wait for it to come back. Uh, you're back on mute now, Joe. I was gonna say, I, I love that and uh, super excited that we got this chance to tell the world about the things that we're doing together. Um, if anybody has interest in learning more, um, would like a demonstration, Please reach out to us uh, using the contact forms, and we look forward to, uh, to hearing about your challenges and how we might be able to solve them. So thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.